start with the Socratic review method. It's a little messy right now. Um, oh, okay, Caroline. I'm only working on logic games right now, so nothing to do with logical reasoning. All right, okay. Okay, logic games is tough, but it gets better. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Socratic review method tonight. Um, so I think Kim has already shared the link in the chat, but basically, um, you know, I got a lot of questions asking me, um, you know, what's one thing that helped you out the most during your prep? Um, how did you increase your score? And I would say if I had to give one single tip in terms of how to improve logical reasoning, that would be the Socratic review method. Um, this is something that I picked up that was very specific to Steve's course, um, the LSAT Unplugged course, and it really just brought me over that plateau. So when you're working on logical reasoning, the first stage that you go through is kind of getting used to the question types. Um, you know, question types like sufficient assumption, necessary assumption, must be true. These aren't really questions that we see on a daily basis outside of the LSAT. And you have to get familiar with exactly what it's asking you for. You have to get familiar with the tasks at hand. Um, and once you get a grasp of the theory, your score jumps a little, right? Because you're, you're finally understanding what the test is asking you for. And then the next stage is, you know, familiarizing yourself. You're drilling by question type, perhaps. This might be the prep that some of you guys are doing right now. Um, and you get familiar with it. You know what to do when you see a sufficient assumption question. Your mind goes, okay, step one, I do this. Step two, I do this. Um, and this was also what I did. And then at that point, I pretty much plateaued around, I would say, like a low 160 score to mid 160s. And I wasn't really able to reach that minus three on a logic reasoning section. So when I say minus three, that means getting three questions wrong on, you know, out of 25 questions. Um, that was really hard. And, you know, no matter how much drilling I did by question type, that just didn't work. Uh, so you have to really dig deep into why you're getting these questions wrong. And this is something that Steve shared with me that at that stage, it's not really about the question type that you're struggling with. It's more about the way you're reading the answers, the way you're reading the stimulus and your understanding. It's not about the question type that you're struggling with anymore. Um, so I started doing the Socratic review method um, and I've shared with you tonight a kind of a spreadsheet that I've created. Um, so it says LSAT Unplugged Socratic Review Worksheet. And um, I really, really implore all of you guys to work through this during your review process. Um, so you see here, you know, first make a list of the question number, question type that you've done, the conclusion, if there was one, the premise. And then if you got the question wrong or if it confused you, ask yourself, why did the question confuse you? Was it the passage, the stimulus that confused you? Was it the answer choices that confused you? So for example, if you said, you know, the answer choice confused me, why did it confuse you? So you really have to dig deep into these sort of questions. So, and then you go the next step down. If the answer choice confused you, then why did you choose the incorrect answer choice? So what element in there attracted you to it? And why is this incorrect? And then you analyze the correct answer choice. So what made it seem unappealing to you? And why was this choice correct as opposed to the original incorrect answer choice that you were attracted to? And after all of this, write yourself a short takeaway, a summary of how do you avoid the same mistake in the future? So what will I be more aware of next time? So I'll sh I've also shared with you um, this very candid example of just what I used to do during my prep. So this was for PT86. Um, I'm in the Word document that says Socratic Review Method Candid Example PT86 Analysis. And you'll see that this is very candid because I'm, some of it doesn't really like make sense because I was just typing to myself at the time. Um, but you see how I'll write down the question type, kind of summarize the stimulus, conclusion, um, the premise, 
what I got wrong, so the incorrect answer choice. And then I write myself a little analysis of just my thought process. So I'm gonna go down to this example, um, point of agreement. So you see here, I've written down the stimulus, what the stimulus has said, and then the incorrect answer choice. And then, you know, I said, well, this is true for X, it's not completely supported by M, and then she said this, I cannot assume this, and blah, blah, blah. It was just my thinking of how did I get to this incorrect answer choice, and why can I do this? Why is this incorrect? And then I go on to say, okay, what was the correct answer? And then, you know, ultimately I arrive at a takeaway. So for here, for a point of agreement, I said, if an answer choice is verbatim or a paraphrase of only what one person says, it's likely to be incorrect. And then I told myself with point of agreement questions, keep in mind what both speakers' conclusions are. Be careful with quantity words, few, many, some. Um, these could make the answer choice incorrect. You know, just takeaways like this. And eventually, as you go on and do more practice tests and more in-depth review, you'll start finding that you have particular thought patterns or you'll arrive at particular assumptions um, regularly. And by doing this, you're able to catch them and change the way in which you think about different questions. Um, so I just wanted to share this because this was really, really helpful in my LR prep process. Um, and I really do hope you guys give it a go. It is time consuming. It's not the best thing, the most interesting thing to do, but it definitely helps. All right, I have a question here by Hyun Jung. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Sorry if I'm not. Um, do you memorize the pattern of a right answer choice when you do the review method? Um, okay, so what do you mean by the pattern of a right answer choice? When you get the wrong answer. There is a pattern that we're thought wrongfully. I'm sorry, I'm still not really understanding um, what you mean by memorizing the pattern. Feel free to unmute yourself as well if you want to do that. Sure, I'll just talk. I'm sorry, just trying to type as, as much as <laughs> it's okay. So I, I wanted to question whether you, um, so let's say you got something wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And you do the review method and you see that there's the reason, uh, you kind of find the reason why you got it wrong. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why um, the correct answer is a correct, uh, the, the correct answer is is correct. And there's a, there's some sort of pattern as a mean of like step by step and and th th there's some reason why this, this correct answer choice is a correct answer. And so I, I I um I I call this as a pattern just in case just just trying to make it simpler because mm -hmm. um it seems to me that um there's always like a right logical pattern when mm -hmm. whenever whatever uh uh how do I say it? the the question types they have for example mm -hmm. resolve the paradox there's a rifle uh, method on approaching this question type to get to the right choice and and so I, I thought that you know like if there is a right if there's a slightly um the wrong step on getting the 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 uh, right answer mm -hmm. um, then by editing uh, by reviewing uh the method uh you, you see that there's a I'm, I'm sorry i'm just kind of like no i i get what you're saying now i completely understand you're talking about um if i'm understanding correctly you're talking about pattern recognition when it comes to like question types whether or not by doing you know all of these questions and by doing deep review am i finding um a particular type of question type which correlates with a particular type of answer choice are you talking yes. about that whether whether or not i found a pattern yeah so do you memorize those things so that you know next time you don't get you don't get lost or you don't get it wrong. 
Okay. I have to say, unfortunately, after, you know, I did prep for like months, right? And I, I did like very deep review. And I have to say, maybe it's just me, but it's going to be a disappointing answer that I didn't find any sort of very strong pattern that one can just stick to um, in terms by question type. Um, so as I was, I'll explain this. So as I was going through the Socratic review method, you know, like towards like, I would say midway when I like really got into it, um, I started to see certain patterns as you were saying. Um, but so I would write a takeaway, right? I would write a takeaway like on, I don't know, name point questions. The, the correct answer are likely to be this. Um, and I would write that to myself. And then the next time I would do it, I would find that sometimes that would lead me to the wrong answer because LSAT test writers are very smart. Um, they sometimes will write answer choices that sound like they're right. And if you're just, um, I guess, trying to take a shortcut by using pattern recognition, sometimes you're gonna be led to the wrong answer choice because you're, if you're super confident and just like, this one pattern, as soon as you see that, you're gonna you're gonna pick that answer, right? And you're not gonna read any of the other answer choices. Um, so that's definitely taking a shortcut and I've been led astray by that method at times. So towards the end, um, some of my takeaways definitely became more qualified where I'll be like, okay, sometimes it'll be like this, but still read all the other answer choices and confirm that that is the right answer. Um, so I, I hope that helps. So basically, you're, you're saying not to memorize, but instead trying to understand as much as you can. I would say don't try to find a shortcut um, and try to see if there is a pattern for the right answers. Um, and don't just rely on, OK, so like this is the pat I think this is the pattern. And then as soon as I see and I, I specific identifier, that's immediately the right answer. I, I would say don't do that, but instead I would say the Socratic review method is less about pattern recognition, but more about learning about the specific false assumptions that you have in your thought process. At times, I will find myself in my analysis saying, okay, because this certain word was in the stimulus or because the certain word was a match in the answer choice, it led me to think that this was the correct answer and this assumption sprung up and that's why I was led astray. So I would say that this particular exercise of the Socratic review method, it's more about exposing the way, the faulty thought processes that you have in terms of approaching the LSAT and less about pattern recognition. But it's pattern recognition for yourself because um, you're, you'll start recognizing patterns of how you have been thinking falsely in terms of approaching the questions. So I hope that helps. Uh, Caroline, you want me to share all the documents? I will compile a list of the links um, after this class and I'll maybe send it to Steve and then he can send you like a whole document of it. Um, but it'll be very boring and it, a lot of it will make sense, but you can you can go through my thought process. Um, I'm going to go up a little. Jocelyn, you have a question. Go for it. Yeah, um, this is Jocelyn here. So um, I wanted to kind of connect what you were saying to the our colleague who answered her asked a question rather to what you said Steve stated as far as um, the review review method uncovering how you're how you're thinking about a particular question or how you're you're making assumptions that you shouldn't be making as you approach the LSAT. Can you unpack that a little bit? I personally find that like, as I'm trying to like review, um, like for example, inference questions, for example, um, it can be difficult to, when I'm trying to, you know, review my own work to kind of unpack and figure out where I missed it. Mm -hmm. um, because I feel like what I, like my perspective or my view is kind of still overshadowing how I should be reviewing and then I'm not really reviewing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Um, 
are you using this? So I would say there's a very specific way to like make sure you really get down into like the trenches of your thoughts. So I think the first step would be asking yourself, you know, what confused you, right? Like, was it the question type? Like, did you, were you confused by the question type and were you confused by what to do there? That's like the first thing, right? And then if you go back to the stimulus and you take a look at the stimulus, were you confused by what the conclusion was? Were you confused by what the premise was? Were you confused by the method of reasoning? And then you think about, okay, so why is this like answer choice incorrect? Um, why did I think that this was correct? I don't know if that helps. I know it's, I don't think I've ever found an instance where um, I really, really couldn't figure out where, why my thought process le led me there. Um, although, no, there may have, but I did have a study buddy, which I would recommend to everyone here. Um, but I, I guess I would probably reach out to my study buddy and just kind of say like, I'm really having issues with this question um, and have them kind of unpack it a little bit. But I, I think in general, this method is definitely helpful. Uh, Markos, you have a question. And I see you have your hand raised as well. Yes, I actually had a question. So um, you said that, um, I think you said you scored a min you were scoring like a minus three, right? If I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken? Yeah. So, so you also took the flex, correct? Yes. And here's, you know, sorry if I get, it's not personal, but what was your, your, your hard, I guess, like for you, what was kind of difficult um, as far as an LR? Like what was difficult for you? Yeah, this is not personal at all. I'm like, I'm happy to share. Um, so for LR, let's see, what was difficult for me? I think what was difficult at the beginning was different to what was difficult towards the end. So at the beginning of my process, I was, it was very difficult for me to get the inference questions right, because that's like hard logic, right? You have to understand conditional reasoning. You have to understand how to make inferences in terms of like, must be true, sufficient assumption, necessary assumption were certainly very difficult for me because there was a lot of, again, conditional reasoning. You have to do like a very specific task and getting used to that was not easy. But as I learned the, the method um, and got used to it. I drilled um, it. I realized that for those sort of hard logic questions, they're almost like a logic game question where there's only one correct answer choice. It's almost like an equation. You're able to like derive the correct answer after you do the work. Um, and then so, but you know, in contrast to that, in the beginning, like strength and weaken, we all know how to strengthen and weaken arguments. So at the beginning, um, those were the easiest. But towards the end, I realized that um, a lot of the answer choices for, for example, strengthen and weaken questions are, or most strongly supported, they are somewhat qualified. So you'll see question stems where it says, um, which one of these most strengthens? the argument, for example. So those became the most difficult because I definitely did see some answer choices where it strengthened somewhat the argument, but maybe it wasn't the most. And I would find myself kind of flip-flopping between the two answers. So yeah, it's it's different for me um, in terms of like stages of prep. Yeah, and, and my, my other question is, when you took the flex, were you, because this is where I'm kind of paranoid, and I did bring it up to Steve, and he, and I, I knew that he couldn't really answer it, but what I'm afraid of is, um, so like you said about inference questions, I was having issues with that too. Um, I, for some reason, um, I was just getting like, if I would do 20, 10 of them, I was getting like all 10 wrong. So I just started just drilling inference questions like must be true and most strongly supported. And now, like, I mean, I'll average out of 10, maybe like six or maybe five, you know, on a bad day, maybe four. But that's because I really wasn't reading it or following Steve's way of like, like you said, like, it's like a game. And that's what I have seen. Like, you, I, re I, I actually do have to uh, write it out, in other words, when I when I do that. But <clears throat> my question is, um, on when you took the LSAT flex, 
was there a question that you kind of did not see? Like maybe you didn't see a necessary assumption or that you were anticipating and, and I guess you, you saw most of, cause I know every test changes, but what I'm afraid of is if I walk into a test and I spent so much time on like sufficient assumptions and inferences, and I don't even, I don't even see one, which I, I don't know if that could be possible because I do, I, when I take a test, I do all four sections. And I've seen there's times where like, I'll do, you know, like one section and I'll just see one sufficient assumption question, or I won't even see one in one section, but then I'll see it in the other section. Um, so is it, did you kind of see that also when you took the flex or, you know, your opinion on that? Yeah. I mean, the flex, uh, the way they've been doing it, I mean, I only took one flex, so I, I can't say I have like a large enough sample size, but at least from what I know of the test, um, the flex, it's very similar to all previous text, uh, tests and administrations before the flex. So it's not like they've, they have new question types or anything, or it's not like they all of a sudden added like 10 strengthened questions and made the section completely unbalanced. Um, I will say that during, so when I took the flex, um, I did a lot of like sleuthing online to see which PTs they were pulling from. And they were pulling a lot of their practice tests for the flex, at least last year from PT 60s and 70s. This is not official information. So like, don't quote me, but this is what everyone was saying. So, you know, those are tests um, just like a few years back. So they're not, it's not like completely new test sections. Um, it has not become unbalanced. And in terms of um, your question about making inferences and being worried that you're, you're spending a lot of time on, you know, like sufficient assumption questions, um, I would say if you're practicing the hard skill of, for example, conditional reasoning, contrapositives, um, making inferences out of uh, those sort of equations, um, like you said, those are skills that will ca carry through in no matter what sort of, not even just in the um, LR section, but those will be useful to you in also the logic gains section as well. And those skills, you know, they show up in sufficient assumption questions, they show up in sometimes necessary assumption, they show up in um, method of reasoning, they show up even in parallel reasoning like we're doing today, they show up in must be true. So those are hard skills that are transferable throughout the test. Um, so I, I don't think you'd be wasting time practicing and drilling those. Um, in terms of drilling, I would say if you're um, don't just keep drilling if you're if you're not getting a lot of the questions right. Um, I would say if you're drilling and drilling and not getting any results, that would probably indicate that you can still improve your understanding of what you're doing. Um, so don't just drill and drill in the bad habits, um, but instead just like slow down and kind of think about what you're doing wrong and if there are any areas where you can improve that understanding of theory. I hope that helps. Uh, let's see, any other questions? I have a quick question, sorry. I noticed um, how your, like your format, did you do this for every logical reasoning question or um, in the beginning when you were working them out or do you did you just do um, these outlines for like particularly when you um, were at the point where you were just drilling um, PTs? Uh, yeah, I definitely didn't do this for like every question that I did. I don't know how long that would have taken, but even, even this, like it took a long time. Um, so I did start doing this after I started doing complete logical reasoning sections. So I would pick out every question that I flagged and every question that I got incorrect. I wouldn't do these for the questions that I did get correct because, I mean, if I got it correct, I, I probably don't need to be like deeply analyzing what I'm doing at that point. Um, so these are only for the incorrect answers that I got. Yeah. So yeah, so what I would do is I would, for example, take a PT on Monday, and then the next day I would go through this deep review using the Socratic review method. Um, 
analyze all the questions that I got wrong, write myself these little takeaways that you see in bold. Um, and then the next time I would take another practice test, say in like on Thursday, right before the test, um, going into it, I would read the takeaways to myself again, just so that I reinforced them and didn't make the same mistake again on the next practice test that I was doing. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.